So uh, again, thanks for coming. And we're going to be looking at Lazarus. So it's really John 11 and John 12 that we'll be considering. We've looked at Martha of Bethany and we've looked at Mary of Bethany. And now we're going to look at Lazarus of Bethany. Now it says in verse number one of John 11, now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his, his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. He heard he was sick, and in the face of things, he did nothing. Strange verse of scripture. And then it says in verse 7 that after that, he said to his disciples, let us go again into Judea. Uh, verse number 25, um, Jesus said unto Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe. Uh, verse number uh, 32 says, Now when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, with her he groaned in spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved them. And some of them said, Could not this man have opened the eyes of the blind and caused that even this man should not have died? And Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, comes to the grave. It was a stone, a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus says, Take away the stone. And we read that uh, in verse number 43, that when Jesus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and the face, his face bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. Verse 1 of chapter 12, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, and there they made him a supper. Verse 9, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that Jesus was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Let's just go over to verse 23, down to verse 23 of chapter 12. Uh, and Jesus answered them saying, this is in response to the, the Greeks that had said we would see Jesus. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honour. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify 
thy name. And there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And we know that we're all familiar with these verses, but I trust the reading of them might have just thrilled our hearts again this afternoon. I suppose as we look at particularly John chapter 11, we're really confronted with just the normal experience of life. We're confronted with a grave and we're confronted with grief and we're confronted with groaning. And you know, that is just life, isn't it? It's the the inescapable suffering that humanity passes through. We face graves, we face groanings, and we face grief. But the wonderful thing about this story is this, that there might have been a grave, and there might have been grief, and there might have been groanings, but there was God, and there was glory. And that's what makes all the difference. And that's what makes this chapter so special and this incident so special. We can identify with the, with the groaning and the grief of the sisters. And we can stand in awe and worship at the intervention of God and his glory. This sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God. Twice over that little expression is mentioned, that this is for the glory of God. And it's good to remember in the difficulties and the storms and the sorrows of life, and although we feel the pain of these things and the grief and the heartache, and the disappointments and the discouragements, it's good to know that God is moving, working all things according to his purpose and ultimately for his eternal glory. I might have mentioned it in one of the previous occasions, but uh, verse number one is just so specific. Now, a certain man was sick. But John doesn't leave it at that. He, he tells us the man's name. And he tells us the place that he came from. And in case there's any dubiety as to who this man is and where he comes from, he'll tell us that it was the very town of Mary and her sister, Martha. You see, it's good to remind our hearts that the Lord is interested in all the details of our life. He knows our name, and he knows who we are, and he knows where we come from, and he knows exactly the circumstances that we find ourselves in this afternoon. Our Savior is a personal Savior. He's a personal Lord. He's a personal friend. <clears throat> And, you know, that must have meant much to Mary and Mary. I know there's a lot of confusion and there must be a lot of doubts. And and and, and Mary and Martha, uh, you know, I don't know all the emotions they must have went through uh, in these days. But, you know, how encouraging just to know that Jesus knew everything about them. And life can be tough. And life is tough. But he knows who we are, where we are, where we belong in, and he knows what we're going through. You know, I, I thought the chapter really throws up the, the, the great problem of disease, the problem of suffering. You know, it says that Mary loved Martha and her sister and, and Lazarus, and yet he, he allowed them to suffer. He allowed them to suffer. And you know, when you and I got saved, we didn't get an exemption card from all the sorrows and sufferings and disease of this life. 
There's no exemption. And we all go through the same trials as the people in the world go through. We suffer the same sicknesses and the same sorrows and the same storms. There's no exemption from any of it. But the wonderful thing that we have that the ungodly don't have, we have this assurance that in the storms, we're still loved. We're still loved. We're still his. You know, Lazarus is, is referred, referred to as the friend of Jesus. You know, we sometimes sing that old-fashioned song, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. It's good to have a friend, a friend like Jesus, a friend that understands and even though he might not be there face to face or even at the other end of a telephone, we just know that he's there and he can be relied upon and trusted. And Mary and Martha in the midst of the sickness of their brother and the sorrow at his death, they're undergirt with this glorious truth that they're loved by Jesus. It's not only the problem of disease, there's the problem of, of delay. You know, it says the Lord abode two days. Why did he not come? Why did he not just drop what he was doing and make a beeline for Bethany? Why did he wait two days before he started in the journey? The problem of delay. You know, we see the same, don't we, in, in the story of, of, of Jairus as he comes pleading with the Lord Jesus for his little daughter. She's just to the point of death. This, this, this is urgent. This is a necessity. This is priority. And Jairus has got his stand there in the crowd and, and watch as the Lord Jesus brings the cloud crowd to a stop and, and deals with a woman that's been diseased for 18 years. Problem of denial, problem of delay. But you know, the reality is that there is never any delays. <laughs> there might be as far as our time perspective is and as far as our expectations are, but there's no delays because the Lord is working always and minutely to a timetable. The Lord's always in time. Dead four days, but the Lord was in time. You know, if it actually came just at the bidding of Mary and Martha, think of what we would have lost out on. You know, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had John 11. We wouldn't have had the bulk of John 12. If the Lord had delayed his coming. He really came just at the right time. And he came for the right purpose. Can't we do the can't we do the right thing? You see, if he just rushed to Bethany and, and, and touched Lazarus and, and raised them to health and strength, he would just have been one of many that had known the healing of the Lord. But the Lord had something greater in mind. The Lord had a greater display of his power and a greater display of his glory that would be manifest in him staying two days where he was. You know, it's interesting, the timetable in these chapters. The raising of Lazarus from the dead was the catalyst. to the arrest and the trial and the crucifixion of Christ. That's what kicked it all off. I know the Jewish leaders had been plotting behind the scenes for a long while and they're just waiting their opportunity and this was it. It was when Lazarus was raised from the dead 
And all the people were believing on the Lord because they'd seen the glory of the Lord and resurrection power and the Jews said, it's time to move. It's time for us to move. We read these verses in chapter 12 where the Lord speaks about, about, about the hour. When he speaks about being troubled, save me from this hour. And he says, Father, glorify your name. So when the Lord is saying this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. He wasn't just thinking of the glory of God in the raising of Lazarus. He's thinking of the glory of God in his crucifixion and ultimate resurrection and exaltation. Because the four days, as it were, that he seemed to be late was all part and parcel of the program of God because God was going to use this very incident to really stir up the Jewish leaders to act and to arrest Christ and to crucify him. I thought as well it raises the problem of denial. The denial of her prayer. You see, Mary and Martha had great expectations. They knew what they wanted. <laughs> they just wanted their brother healed. And the Lord says no. The Lord says no. Sometimes he does say no. Sometimes he does say no. I did notice, and I think I said this in one, one of the previous afternoons, you know that the, the appeal of Mary and Martha was full of expectation. But it was devoid of instruction. It was devoid of instruction. They just says, he whom you love is sick. Lord, here's the problem. Here's the problem. And they just left it with him. You know, sometimes we bring our problems and difficulties to the Lord, and then we tell the Lord what to do about them. So on the one hand, there's an expectation for him to act, but then there's instructions as to how we want him to act. <laughs> but I really rejoiced at the faith of Mary and Martha as they just laid their brother, as it were, at the fear of Jesus, he whom you love. Sick, and they were so assured of his love that he would act, and that their, their, their brother would be well. But their expectation was far exceeded. <laughs> they were expecting a healing, and they experienced a resurrection. And, you know, maybe oftentimes the Lord exceeds our expectations. And we need to be open and we need to be ready for that and, and, and not to try to uh, sort of put the Lord in, in a shoebox and, and his dealings in it, but to realize that he's the almighty, he's the sovereign one. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And just to bring all our problems and our issues and all the rest of the stuff that can, and just bring them to him. Knowing that he loves us and just leaving at his feet, believing that he is able to do. I was thinking Monday night, you know, Ruth sang that song, we still know that I am God. And I'm sure we were thrilled as she explained the background to that song, the background to her writing that song. And to see the wee lad sitting there that had been the subject of a mum and dad's prayers when he was sick and in intensive care just after he was born. And God answered that prayer. And the wee boy was sitting there and one day listening to his mum speak these words and sing that song. But you know, I was thinking of a granny that was sitting here on Monday night. 
with 21 years ago. Her daughter gave birth to twins. And they were in intensive care. And the mom and the dad and the family prayed and the Christians prayed. And one of the wee, wee ones was taken home. And after the funeral, the other one passed away. And another funeral had to take place. And we say, why? Why was one prayer answered and the other prayer was denied? There's no real answer to that. Apart from resting at all in the hands of a sovereign God who's working all things according to the counsel of his will. And we all know the story of the guy who, the minister who arrived at the pit head and there was a, a, a tragedy underground and many of the miners had lost their lives and the grieving wives and families were gathered at the pit head and the tears were flowing. And he wondered what he could say. And he's opened his Bible. An embroidered bookmark fell out of his Bible onto the ground and he picked it up. And as he picked it up, he was looking at all the tangled threads at the back of the bookmark. And then he turned it over. And he read the words, God so loved the world. And you see all the tangled mess at the back was just really a means of displaying the glorious truth of God and his love. And we don't understand why our prayers, all our prayers, are not answered the way that we want them to be answered. And other people seem to be and ours aren't. And we maybe get discouraged and despondent, maybe get bitter against God. But just the rest that all things he does ultimately ends up and glory to his great and holy name. There's a big problem of death itself in the chapter. Lazarus had died. Death's hard, it's tough, it's sore. But you know, as we said already, that this little family in Bethany were under guilt with the love of Christ. And whatever you're going through, whatever trials you're going through, and whatever trials we'll go through in the future, we can know this reality, we can rest in it, that our whole lives are undergirt by his love. His pure, perfect love, unmerited love. And he holds us in his loving arms. He's there when we don't see him, when we don't hear him, when we don't see the evidence of him working in our behalf. He's there, the same yesterday, today, forever, the one who is love, the very nature, the essence, the being of God is love. Mary and Martha were under guilt with her. And in the storms of life, we're surrounded by divine love. Divine love underneath us all. Divine love around us. Divine love above us, encased in the love of God. The love of God. <laughs> Resurrection is really what the chapter's about, isn't it? That's the big thing. You know, Lazarus come forth. Lazarus come forth. Your know, resurrection is a principle that is inbuilt in creation. The Lord will allude to that. You know, chapter 12, when he says, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground, it dies. But, but if it dies, it, it brings forth, brings forth fruit. You know, we're all aware of the, the reality of resurrection. 
we're just coming to that time of the year when when everything around us in nature the that you know it's it's it's, it's going to die <laughs> it's going to die but you know we look forward to the springtime when it's all going to come alive again it's all going to be raised and the farmer will sow his seed in the springtime, and he'll look forward with anticipation to, to a harvest. He'll look forward to, re to resurrection. You know, the glorious thing is this, that he expects far more from the resurrection than what he sowed. <laughs> you know, if you only get back what he sowed, then it's hardly worth sowing. But he's looking forward to the increase. <laughs> the truth of resurrection. You have got the story here of the historical resurrection of Lazarus. Four days in a grave stinking. <laughs> That's pretty extreme, isn't it? The story of Jairus' little daughter that we alluded to earlier, you know, she had just died. The grave clothes weren't even wrapped around her. And the Lord raised her. That was mighty power. And the widow of Nain, her son, was not only wrapped in the grave clothes, but they were on the way to the very cemetery. The Lord Jesus draws near and touches the coffin and, 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 and he's raised from the dead. That's mighty power. And here's Lazarus, four days, he's in the tomb. The tomb's sealed, he's stinking. <laughs> but you know, it's not too hard for the Lord. <laughs> mighty power of resurrection. Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. You know, it's often been pointed out, it's a good job, he says, Lazarus come forth, or everybody would have come forth out of the tomb. Because, you know, that's what's going to happen in a day that's just future. When the Lord Jesus Christ will come from heaven with a shout. A shout of resurrection. You know, he, he just took that wee girl by the hand and said, little maid, arise. So tender, so gentle, so quiet. He touched the coffin, but he cried with a loud voice into the open tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. He's coming with a shout, aren't he? A shout that will raise the dead. The dead in Christ shall rise first. It's interesting that he said to the disciples, you know, he says, Lazarus is, Lazarus is sleeping. Lazarus is sleeping. So he says, let's go and we'll just wake him up from sleep. You know, it's almost as if the whole thing was, it was no big deal to the Lord, as it were. This wasn't going to stretch the limits of his power. This wasn't going to take him beyond anything that he was incapable of doing. He says, we'll just go and we'll just wake him up. We'll wake him up. You know, the Bible describes the, the death of the believer as a putting to sleep. Put to sleep in Jesus. It's lovely that, isn't it? Almost as if you just, you know, it was like when you had a baby and you just rocked the baby in, in your arms and, and, and the baby just fell asleep. Fall asleep in Jesus. Awaiting a moment when we'll be wakened again. Wakened again. So the raising of the dead in a day that's yet to come is just as simple to the Lord Jesus as a mother wakening up her sleeping child. 
Such is his almighty power. You know, sometimes as kids get older, it's it take a bit of weakening. But you know, the Lord will not take it'll not take much for the sleeping, those who are asleep in Jesus to be raised at the resurrection. He will give that shout, and the dead in Christ shall be raised. So it is historic, the story, but it is symbolic. It's symbolic of our resurrection as believers in a, in a day to come. That, that, that there are multitudes of believers down through the centuries that have been put to sleep and, and they're asleep in the grave, as it were. But there's coming that day when every last one of them will be, will be awakened again in that glorious day of resurrection. But I think the Lord is thinking beyond Lazarus and he's thinking beyond us and he's thinking about himself. You know, the Bible says concerning the Lord Jesus that he's the, he's the first fruits of them that slept. He's the firstborn from among the dead. He's the preeminent one. And I think the Lord was thinking as he stood at that grave, he was thinking beyond the circumstances of that present moment. And he's thinking of that which just lay ahead for him. You know, we have in these verses something of the depths of the compassion, the heart of Christ. You know, we read that wee verse in verse 35 where it says Jesus wept. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He knew that in a couple of minutes' time, Lazarus was out alive. But he wept. He wept. These were not just kind of crocodile tears. It says he groaned. He says it was trouble. This is heartfelt emotion. This is heartfelt sympathy with, with Mary and Martha. This is feeling the weight and the burden of the consequence of disease and death and sin. And he feels it in the very depths of his being. He shares. He shares in the grief and the sorrow of the sisters. You know, what a beautiful picture of the high priestly ministry of the Lord Jesus for us. And Hebrews 4 will tell us that we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tested, tempted, tried, such as we, apart from sin. We've got a high priest who's never out of touch with our reality. When no one else understands, and no one else sympathizes, and no one else is there. He is sharing in our reality. The shared feelings, the mutual passion and love of the Lord Jesus. He knows what we're going through. He understands. He sympathizes. He shares in our reality. Just to get that this afternoon. When things seem to go all wrong in, in life. And you wonder, why does all this happen to me? Why is my family not turning out the way that other families have turned out? And, and, and you know, why all the struggles? Why all the storms? Why all the pain and the loneliness and the suffering? Why? There's one that shares in a reality. There's one that knows and he sheds tears. And our tears blend with his tears as he ministers before our Father in heaven. But I mentioned him. He mentioned I mentioned that it's not only symbolic of our death and resurrection, but but his 
And, you know, it is interesting, and we read it in verse 27 of chapter 12, now is my soul troubled. So he was troubled in, in chapter 11 at the death of, of, uh, of, of Lazarus, but he's now troubled in chapter 12 about his own death. His own death. Again, it shows the, the humanity of the Lord Jesus. Father, save me from this hour, he cries. The garden, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Father, save me from this. The horror of death. The anguish of crucifixion, the torment of the cross. He didn't face it stoically. He was troubled, troubled in his spirit. He groaned in an agony in the garden, sweating, as it were, great drops of blood as he contemplated. Yes, he knew. In John 11, he knew that Lazarus would be raised. He knew, but he wept and he groaned and was troubled. And he knew that on the third day, he would rise from the dead. But facing death in its stark awfulness, he wept and he was troubled and he was anxious. Oh, just to get the heart of Christ, the emotions, the humanity of the Lord Jesus. Yes, he's truly God, but he's verily, verily human. I think as well that there's a sense in which the Lord was just demonstrating how many times that he told his disciples, you know, that he would go to Jerusalem and, and he would be crucified and he would rise again. And just a few days out from that, he's just giving them a wee reminder, I've, you know, I've got the power to rise again. If I've got the power to raise someone out of the dead, then I've got power to raise myself from the dead. And just giving them that wee further evidence. And of course they missed it because when Christ died and the world fell apart and when he was raised from the dead, they didn't believe him. And yet he told them and he gave them the evidence of his power to do it. I thought there was one massive difference between Lazarus and, uh, and his resurrection or his burial and the burial of the Lord Jesus. You know, Martha says, you know, she, was, she didn't want the tomb open. She says, he's stinking, he's stinking. Stinkin'. You know, it says concerning the Lord Jesus, that it said concerning God, he would not, I would not allow his Holy One to see corruption. There was no stinking of the corpse. There was no decay of the, the body of the Lord Jesus. You know, men called that a corpse. It was a body. The body of the Lord Jesus. It saw no corruption. So it was historical. It was symbolic. I suppose it's also, we can think of it from doctrinally. <laughs> um... You know, when a person is saved, when a person is born of the Holy Spirit, then, then there's a sense in which they die and they're buried and they're raised again. You know, that resurrection is there right to the point of salvation, the point of conversion. There's resurrection. There's death, burial, resurrection. You know, that's really what Paul tells us in Romans 6, isn't it? The opening verses of Romans chapter 6. I know these are verses we turn to uh, when someone is being baptized, but baptism is just really the picture of what has already taken place. And when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus, we were identifying ourselves with the Lord Jesus. We are saying we are one with him in his death and in his burial and in his resurrection. And doctrinally, before God, positionally, we have died with Christ, buried and we've been raised to walk in newness of life, to walk in the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But I suppose we could see the thing not only historically and symbolically and, and doctrinally, but, but spiritually, practically in our lives. Because, you know, Paul says in verse 12 or verse 11 of, uh, verse 11 of Romans 6, he says, you know, he says, we are dead, he says, but, but we have got to reckon ourselves to be dead. We've got to make that real in our experience. What we are positionally before God must be practical in our experience. We must reckon ourselves to be dead and buried and raised and walking in newness of life. Peter Brandon used to say that he attended his own burial service every morning. That as he rose up to face another day, he came before God and reckoned himself, Peter Brandon, dead, buried, but raised in newness of life. To live his life out of a new source, not to live his life out of that old Peter Brandon's abilities and instincts and desires, but to live his life out of Christ, the risen head, the new source to fulfill his will and his power and for his glory. You know, that is vital for all of our experiences. We need to come there and keep there in our spiritual lives. You know, I thought it was interesting that the persecution came against Lazarus when he was raised from the dead, when he was living in the power of a new life, that's when the opposition came. They're not only going to try to put, and they did put Christ to death, they wanted to put Lazarus to death. You see, the world can't cope, the, the religious world can't cope with a resurrected man. A man living in the power of new life. And the religious Jews couldn't cope with that. Or the cope with people getting raised and, and, and multitudes getting fed and, 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 and walking in water. But, you know, they couldn't cope with this. They couldn't cope with a man raised from the dead, a man in the power of resurrection. You know, the religious world still can't cope with that. But, you know, that's the type of life that we are called to live. You know, Paul says in, in Philippians 2, let the heart cry of Paul that I might know him. The power of his resurrection. He's not thinking about the future. He's thinking about the present. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings been made conformable unto his death. He's thinking of the practical, experiential, working out of what took place at his conversion when he died and was buried and was raised in Christ. And he's praying that that might be true in his, in his life, that he might know Christ and know the power of resurrection in his life and even fellowship with his sufferings and been made conformable under his death. I mentioned before, when I was young, I read biographies, autobiographies galore. You know, it's interesting that you read all the mighty men of God. There was a point in their life when the deep dealings we got. I think of Muller, Hudson Taylor, Watchman Nee, D.L. Moody, Andrew Murray. Oswald Chambers, Amy Carmichael, go on and on and on and on. There came a point in their experience when that which was true doctrinally became true in reality in their lives and, and they died. And they presented themselves alive unto God as vessels to be filled with the life of Christ in order that Christ might be glorified in them. There's an interesting wee book that's called They Found the Secret by a guy called Raymond Derman. 
an interesting account of the testimonies of a number of believers who knew something of this power, the power of new life, the power of resurrection in their life in ministry. Just in closing, and we notice that the Lord gave life and then he says, loose them, loose them and let them go. You see, the old grave clothes had to be taken away. You know, and that's what you've got in, in Colossians chapter 2. I don't have time to, to go through that. Colossians 2, 11 to 13, and then from verse 20 down into verse 17 of chapter 3. You know, it's the same idea. It's this idea of identification with the Lord Jesus. Since you then be raised with Christ, seek, ye, seek, the, seek the, the things which, are, uh, which be above, not the things which are enough. And then he'll speak about putting on and putting off. <laughs> the things we need to put off. We need to put off the old grave clothes. You know, the stuff that marked us as children of Adam. The things of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh. They, we, need, we need to deal with that. These need to be cast away like filthy, moth-eaten, beggarly garments. And we need to put on. We need to put on. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. We need to live in the good of the power of the new man, the resurrected Lord Jesus. You know, one of the basic principles of Christian living is that we need to die to live. We need to die to live. <laughs> you know, the power of resurrection, the power of the new life will never be seen in us unless unless the old, the old lives died. <laughs> unless we are finished with it, unless we acquiesce with God and God's condemnation of it, and we see it buried in the tomb and, and say that's all it's fit for. And then to accept day by day the power of that new life, the infusion of that new life. It's interesting, the Lord says, and that's why we read at the end of uh, chapter 12, or the middle of chapter 12, uh, where the Lord Jesus talks about the corn of wheat falling to the ground. He was that, we are that, he is, but we are that corn of wheat that falls into the ground and dies. If it doesn't die, then it will bring no fruit. But if it dies, it will bring forth fruit, much fruit. The Lord says, he that loves his life will lose it. He that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And then he makes the appeal, if any man serve me, let him follow me where I am. Where is he? Power of resurrection, exalted in heaven, a heavenly man. <laughs> if any man serve him, serve me, him will my father honor. That need for identification with the Lord Jesus. He's making the, the statement that we, we read there in, in verse number 26, he makes similar statements in various times in his public ministry. Take up the cross, and for the cross is an instrument of death. Take up the cross and follow me. And the Lord was going to the Calvary. He was going to the tomb. He was going to he was going through resurrection and ascension and exaltation. Where I am, where I am, there shall you be also. And that should be our desire to be where He is. I know Ephesians tells us positionally we are seated in the heavenlies in Christ. But to, to live in the good of that, to live that out practically, to live as heavenly people, to be heavenly men, to be heavenly women, to display that heavenly life and that heavenly glory, that the feature of his life might just be seen in us. The appeal of the Lord in chapter 12 is really to give up our lives. To exchange your life for his. That was, that was Hudson Taylor's experience. The exchange life. When he just came to an end, when he just saw the struggle of his life as a Christian. And was at the point of giving up and returning home from China. When he got the revelation of the exchange life. That Christianity was simply exchanging our old life, seeing it buried, and exchanging it for the life of Christ, and to live in the power of that life 
Oh, having no confidence in the flesh. How could we ever? No manifestation of the flesh. But just a manifestation in us in these mortal bodies of the life of the Lord Jesus. We die that he might live. Let's pray.